Did your space systems at I know that was short and brief. I well, I was going to say, I didn't know if you had any opening meeting things you needed to do or if you wanted me to go right away. I'm, I'm, I'm well, good with that. Uh, it looks like we have a fairly small group. So if, uh, if you want to ask me a question during the presentation, either, um, you, you know, just unmute and, and let me know, or we can hold them towards the end, whatever you want to do. And if we run longer, um, I'm certainly able to do that as well. So uh, can everyone see my presentation? I can. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, well, well, good evening. Thank you very much. And uh, this is my second time with your group. And so I tried to make sure I minimize any of the redundancy from before. Uh, and so I thought we would talk a, a few things uh, this evening about what we're currently doing with Aerojet and Rock in uh, Redmond. And, and for those of you that remember, so we've been here for um, 52 years. Originally, the company was called Rocket Research Corporation. And then over, over the years, it's been bought and sold a few times. And now we're por part of a big national conglomerate called Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, a bit of trivia, if you're ever being tested. Uh, all of the engines that took us to the moon the first time back, except for one, were manufactured by what are now part of the Aerojet Rocketdyne family. We actually made the engines that were on the LEM that landed them on the, on the um, surface. And the answer to the trivia question of what was the one other manufacturer that uh, is not part of Aerojet was the engine that lifted the LEM back off the moon's surface or the, the, uh, the, um, the departure engine, if you will, was made by a company called TRW at the time, which is now part of Northrop Grumman. So anyway, a bit of trivia. Uh, all the rest of the engines that were made for that mission, uh, the large engines were made by our Sacramento organization. All the small engines were made here in Redmond, uh, going back all the way uh, back to the time of, of the first uh, landing of the moon 51 years ago. All right, uh, we're 410 people in Redmond. It's a pretty steady number. Um, we over the last three years that I've been running the business, we've been running between 400 and 410 people. The image you see there is um, off of Willows Road, and if you know Redmond at all, there's a big golf course, and we're right across from that. And we occupy about a hundred acres there, and along the side of the hill, the buildings you're looking at there are the office building with the glass, and off to the right are two manufacturing buildings. And what you can't see is at the south end. Um, which is our test facility, which we refer to as a national asset because we can test engines here that no one else, uh, no one else has that kind of capa uh, capability anywhere. And if you were to move that, you'd never be able to get licensed to be in an area like we are. You'd have to put it out in the desert somewhere. So but we're, we're gonna be in Redmond forever. Uh, we say we are 50 years with 100% mission success now I say we're 100 years of 100% mission success. We're halfway there. So it's, it, Redmond's going to be here for a long time. We'll be making engines. This past year, we celebrated 20,000 engines in space. That's not including any of the design and development engines. That's just what we've put into space in the last uh, 51 years. And so uh, we're producing now between five and 600 engines a year that are going to space. And so um, we'll pass 21,000 uh, sometime in mid-2021, just as a point of reference. Uh, and there you go, 52 years of rocketry. If, if you were in my presentation before, I believe I brought some of these posters with me. And so some of you have seen this before. I'm not going to stay on here, but we've been involved in so many different missions over the years. So industry leader in space and launch operations. Today, you take a look at the way... Um, Blue Origin and SpaceX operate, and they're vertically integrated. And that is that they make their own engines, but everybody else uh, has to uh, source those engines from somewhere. And when it comes to the small engines, uh, our organization here in Redmond has the majority of the, of the business throughout the country. And I'll show you that here in a second, but we're doing everything from interstellar space to uh, satellites, all the different orbits. Uh, and then on the launch vehicles, we do all the roll pitch and yaw control. So we steer the upper stage to its uh, separation point. So next chart, hang on a second. Come on. 
All right, some of the different types of propulsion um, and just very simply, basically monopropellant, bipropellant and electric propulsion. Those are the three key, key technologies. They've been a lot, around a long time. Mono and bipropellant have been around for 65, 70 years using hydrazine and the electric propulsion uh, was really developed in the 1990s. Um, we've actually been uh, flying it now for about 20 years, 18 years. Um, you see that white glow that's uh, plasma. It's created by taking an inert gas, in this particular case, argon, and we spin it really fast and run it through a magnetic field and arc, a, uh, arc a, um, a, a, put a big arc of electricity through it that splits the atoms and creates that electric propulsion. So I refer to that as the blue, sm blue smurf hairdo. It's got this blue cone shape coming out of the back of the engine. Electric propulsion is really, really efficient. Uh, and therefore, when you start looking at uh, large missions, moving cargo in space and things like that, you move it towards electric propulsion for the ability to carry enough fuel to do it. So it's not going super fast, but it's gonna carry, carry for a long distance. And then a new area that we're into is into the CubeSat propulsion. If you've been following what's been going on with satellites, they're making them smaller and smaller. And so now we're using um, additive manufacturing. We're printing those tanks. So that tank you see there on the right is actually printed. It takes, it about, takes us about 19 hours to print one of those tanks. And then we put the little four engines on the, on the corners, put a little piping to it, a couple of heaters, a couple of sensors on it. And that makes up about 50% of the spacecraft. And then someone else builds the other, the business side of the spacecraft, you marry the two together. The nice thing about the using green propellants now though, they're much less toxic. And so we're gonna start being able to fill our uh, tanks in the factory and marry that up with the satellite. And so by the time it gets to down to the launch uh, location, we no longer have any of the dangerous processing we used to have to do for satellites. And so we can do it all right in the factory. So it's a pretty neat change that's coming. So you take additive manufacturing, add the, uh, the green propellant, which is uh, less toxic, and you put those things together and you start to really modernize what you're doing in space with the smaller spacecraft. Um, next chart, come on, change, there we go. So I, I talked a little bit about the, the additive manufacturing. We're doing round tanks, we're doing square tanks. So that round tank is about the size of a softball so not very big, and the square tank uh, about the size of a lunchbox, but we can make them deeper or shorter if we need to. Um, in the top left corner, you see GPIM, which is a green propulsion infusion mission. That spacecraft just re-entered the atmosphere in the last two or three days and, and burnt up. It was a joint project between Ball, Ball Aerospace, the government, and us. And we were testing out these green propellants. The spacecraft ran about a year and a half longer than we thought it would. Um, and so we proved that the technology works. The only difference really between the green propellant and the hydrazine, which we've been using forever, besides being far less toxic, is it burns hotter. So you have to be prepared for that when you build your spacecraft. So uh, those engines that you're seeing over on the right, the GR1, the GR1A, the GRM1, uh, use the green propellants. And the, the big difference again is that because there's so much moisture in the fuel, yeah, it burns hotter. So. All right, and next slide. So what does it look like to be a market leader in space? Um, with the propulsion of things that we're building, you can see some of the different spacecraft there. We have more than 70% of the de domestic market share. Um, uh, there's another company that does build engines but on a much smaller scale than we do. And then you have the vertical integrations I mentioned with, with Blue Origin and, and SpaceX. We're on every major domestic satellite pro uh, manufacturer, almost all of NASA's flight programs, all of DOD's flight programs. And some of the things I'm proud of, uh, the NOAA weather satellites, if you're following those satellites, the we're using them now for, for helping with firefighting and these big uh, uh, fires that are bur been burning on the West Coast. Uh, it helps to assign where we should send the water, where we should put resources to put them out. But they're using those weather satellites to help with that. Uh, and then we've been on every human exploration mission flown by NASA. So every uh, 
Yes, every human exploration mission that they've flown. And so we say the path to Mars goes through Redmond. And the reason we, well, I, I have another chart in that in a minute, but um, we've been involved. We, we go back 51 years on the moon with that uh, R4D engine, and we're still building that same model today, although it's been modernized from a material standpoint. Um, the hydrazine hasn't changed that much. And so uh, those engines are really still a workhorse of anything that we need 100 pounds of thrust. Uh, we use that R4D uh, engine for. So um, it's been around a long time. I think we're uh, just short of a thousand of those engines on orbit. Um, and so uh, um, that's the kind of quantities and volumes that we build in Redmond. So, you know, at, since since the moon landing, we've been to every planet. You may have seen a different version of this chart before. We've seen, we've been to every planet, most of the moons. Uh, we're actively involved with the sun. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 now have both left our solar system uh, and are both still communicating with us. Uh, on top of that, we, uh, you know, have Parker Solar Probe since the last time I talked to you. That's been working the moon and I'll show you a little bit of what, what's that that's doing. And if you were following last week, we took a sample off of Ben U and uh, we'll be bringing that back to earth here in 2023. So lots of interesting stuff going on in space today. So come on charts, there we go. Um, Mars, um, we have pr provided the propulsion for every successful landing on Mars to date, whether it's been ones that we've bounced on the big rubber balls or whether we've um, pr provided a soft landing, regardless of how it's gotten there, uh, it's been powered by Aerojet, Rocket Eye, and Redmond, uh, including Curiosity and Spirit and Sojourner, and then some of the more recent uh, missions that have gone to Mars. And so with all that experience, when you look at what it's going to take to actually put people on Mars, uh, or to get astronauts even to orbit Mars, uh, we had a lot of work ahead of us, but we're involved in every aspect of, of sending things to Mars. So um, we'll be providing electric propulsion for the cargo trans uh, transfer. We're building the uh, engines that we're actually delivering in the next couple of months for the Deep Space Gateway, which will, will circle the moon. That's where the astronauts will go to uh, first uh, get acclimated and do work on the moon. And then eventually that's where we'll refuel the spacecraft to send it on to Mars. Um, we're also doing all the deep space transport uh, for both crew and for cargo uh, using that electric propulsion. Remember I said this, it takes longer to get there. Uh, it'll probably take us about a year to get cargo from Earth to Mars. Uh, but with humans, we wanna get that much shorter. And right now we're projecting about 90 days uh, in each direction to move humans from between the moon and Mars. And we have to do it from the moon to be able to carry enough fuel. Um, we, can't, we can't put enough fuel on a spacecraft on Earth in, with today's lift vehicles, get it into orbit and then send it to Mars without running out of fuel. So by going to the backside of the moon, we break the gravitational pull of Earth and we don't need, so we don't need as much fuel and then we can refuel there uh, before we head on to, to, to Mars. And so as, as we know, if you've been following the Orion program at all, which I think I have on the next chart. Yep, so um, the Orion spacecraft. Um, this is the one that we're gonna use to go to the moon. We'll put the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024. But before we do that, we're gonna launch a, an unmanned spacecraft in 2021. And that will go up and around the moon and come back just to prove that everything works. Uh, that spacecraft will be, uh, will have no people in it, but will be heavily adorned with extra sensors uh, to simulate having humans on board. Um, and then the second flight, which will be in 2023, we're going to put two uh, astronauts in orbit around uh, the moon again, just to uh, again validate all of the systems on Orion are working and bring them back to Earth. And then in 2024, the current plan is to put boots on the ground on, on the moon. So when it comes to propulsion for the uh, Orion program, everything is really made here in Redmond with the exception of those launch abort engines. The launch abort engines, we, we run out of Redmond, but we build them in 
Huntsville, Alabama, the, the solid propellant that goes into them is not something we're set up to handle here in, in, in Washington state. But uh, as you can see, that's a, we call it the four seconds of terror when that engine goes off. Um, it's designed to pull the capsule away from the launch vehicle from the time we put astronauts in it until it hits, uh, until it gets on orbit. That's the safety system that would get the astronauts away if there's ever an issue. On the Orion crew module itself, we provide all the propulsion engines for reaction control, for steering, and then to bring it back into Earth and to orient it and, and properly land it. Um, if we were just to use the crew module itself, we could never put enough fuel and, and store enough stuff on it for humans to, to take a mission like that. So there's the European service module, which stays with the capsule until it's ready to, to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, at which point it's jettisoned and burned up. But we also make the uh, main engine for the European service module along with all the auxiliary engines. So uh, the main engine gives you your, your most of your lift uh, from when it leaves the launch vehicle until it gets uh, up to speed uh, to, to break gravitational pull. And then the auxiliary engines are there in case the main engine fails and to provide slight uh, course correction as it goes. And then the RCS engines of which there are 12 on every one they basically provide all the steering control and uh, orientation control when we're coming back into Earth. So I'm going to take a pause there for a minute and see, does anybody have any questions on Orion before I go on? All right, not hearing any, I will move forward. All right, Parker Solar Probe. Um, the next slide will give you a little bit more facts on Parker Solar Probe, but we made all the engines that went on there we actually built the basic spacecraft here in Redmond. Um, and then this is the latter part of the spacecraft with the uh, latter part of the build. Uh, this is actually at uh, the um, propulsion laboratory at, at, that belongs to John Hopkins. But this is when they were putting the shield on the spacecraft and that's on top of, uh, that's on top of it and protects the spacecraft and the instruments, uh, instrumentation from the sun as we're orbiting it. The big key feature for us, for the engine design for this particular one is the accuracy that we had to have to be able to keep that shield pointed at the sun at all times. So the, the, the big deal with the engines is being able to keep that orientation of that spacecraft right so we don't burn up any of the, any of the systems on board. So if you've been tracking Parker Solar Probe, there was just news out last week about some of the things they've learned from uh, the sun. Actually, there's been a lot of data published, but uh, the most recent one having to do with the reason they've discovered why the, the sun's um, uh, storms change direction so frequently and why the magnetic fields flip so frequently. And uh, that paper was just published in the last few days. Um, but just recently in September, we passed the, uh, we passed the sun for the sixth time. Uh, we got to 8.4 million miles from the sun, which is the closest man-made object that's ever gotten there. And we also hit just under 300,000 miles per hour uh, as we slung shot around uh, uh, Jupiter and we're, and we're uh, continue to pick up speed. Um, on that last pass, uh, we hit a new record for, for um, a man-made object at 300,000 miles per hour. It slows down after it passes the sun but then picks up speed again as it makes its approach. Uh, eventually we'll get, uh, I think the top speed is gonna be around 500, 600 miles an hour, I think is what I saw published for the, on the very last pass that we plan to do. So uh, as it gets closer and closer, it'll get faster and faster. Uh, any questions on Parker Solar Probe before I move on? Uh, you guys are just too quiet. Um, the DART mission, the double asteroid redirection test. This is pretty cool because this is the first time that the United States or anyone will actually attempt to move an object in space. And it's really there, it's really the first venture into planetary protection. Um, on the bottom left, you can see the picture of my team back in uh, May when we shipped it off to John Hopkins for final assembly. We actually, again, built the whole spacecraft here in Redmond. Um, they, actually, they provide us the frame. We put all the tanks and the fuel lines and the, 
the engines and everything on here in Redmond. And so you can see that basically fill the tractor trailer with the spacecraft itself and then all the auxiliary support equipment that goes with it. Uh, on the top left, this is from John Hopkins. This is give you a relationary size between the different things that are involved. So um, Didymus B, which is uh, on the left-hand side, that's the moon of uh, Didymus A that we're going to attempt to move. And so uh, in, uh, in when we, uh, 18 months after we launched this vehicle, which is supposed to happen uh, next summer, we will ram that uh, spacecraft into Didymus B and the idea is to move it, to change its trajectory just slightly. And the reason we're using a double asteroid to do it is so that we can measure the differential change between the two planets. Because we know the speed of both of them and the, and the orbiting speed of one on the other, uh, by doing that, we'll be able to make a determination if, we, if we've been successful at redirecting that small moon. And the goal is only to move it a couple inches. They don't need much. They just want to be able to prove that if we hit an object far enough away from Earth, we could change its trajectory and prevent it from hitting Earth in the future. Um, and it, I did a little bit of uh, looking, though, um, looking back to see, um, you know, the speed at which is, these are traveling. But the, these two particular um, asteroids are, are in at no time of any risk of hitting Earth. And so therefore, even if we do slightly change their trajectory as a result of the DART mission, um, there's really still no chance it will ever collide with Earth. All right, and on to my next one. Uh, so here's a picture, an animation of the intention of how we're gonna do it. And uh, on the, just to the below the spacecraft, you'll see a little flat wing that's actually a, uh, an unmanned vehicle that's going to tag along. And so just before DART does contact, it's gonna jettison that little vehicle. And so that vehicle is expected to survive the, uh, the crashing of DART into the, into the moon. And in doing so, uh, it's expected to take video of the event, the event uh, capture all of the data up to the second before the spacecraft hits the the moon and then be able to relay all of that back to Earth. And so that little UAV is going to pop out and fly on its own and, and, and stay there with the, uh, with the spacecraft for a period of time to, uh, to, to capture the results of our collision with that, with that uh, large moon. Uh, and as you saw from my prior slide there, that, that moon's about the size of the Statue of Liberty. So it's, it, it's not tremendously large, but it's still quite a bit when you take a, a, a dormitory sized refrigerator and you run it into something that large, um, you, you know, mass being what it was, you can't create an explosion. It's just the mass against mass. Uh, and the expectation is we're either gonna break off a chunk of it or just the um, adding to its speed will change its trajectory. And that's oversimplified, but that's the plan. All right. Osiris Rex, and if you were following this last week, uh, we did a bump and go with an asteroid called Bennu. Uh, Bennu's um, traveling at about 63,000 miles an hour. My understanding is it uh, takes about 1.2 years for it to, to, um, uh, to, to uh, circle the, the moon. So it's slightly different trajectory than the Earth uh, by 20%. Um, it's, uh, let's see, uh, it's a very old, they picked Bennu because it's very old and fairly close. Um, it's the, it's, um, a, it was, they believe that it was formed about 10 million years after our solar system was formed. And so, um, they discovered it back in, uh, on September 11th of 1999 and chose it because they believed that it was carbonous and that it would have some of the things that we're looking for, some of the precious metals. And so in addition to being able to go up and, and determine uh, what this particular uh, asteroid is made of, um, it's also a test for future asteroid mining. We know we're gonna be able to eventually find asteroids that have precious metals on them and we wanted to be able to prove that we could do that. 
Uh, the pictures on the bottom are from Thursday and Friday last week when we actually took the sample off a of venue and put it back into the cargo hold of, of the spacecraft called the Cyrus Rex. Um, and that, uh, if, if you follow that, they, they uh, ended up getting a lot more material than they thought they were going to. Um, it just came off freely. So when they bumped the, the planet, um, they had a, um, a, a small charge of compressed air that they were going to use to stir up the dust. And, and they did that, but in fact, it was the, the surface was determined to be so loose that they got a lot more material than they thought. They actually overloaded the spacecraft and they were having difficulty getting it stowed, but you can see they've successfully done that now. So that'll stay there in orbit around Bennu until March of next year, uh, at which time it'll head back here to Earth. And in uh, the summer of, uh, of 2023, it'll jettison that little container with a, with a, um, with a, uh, a small parachute on it and it'll land in the desert out there in Utah and, and they'll recover the material. Now, the goal was to pick up two ounces of material off the surface. They think they've got a lot more than that, but um, with a goal of two ounces and a mission cost of $40 million, that's about $20 million an ounce. So it'll be some pretty precious material when it gets back here. But <laughs> the expectation is they're gonna learn a lot more about the, uh, our Earth and how our Earth formed from doing it. And again, on the right, you can see the, the, the uh, spacecraft. Again, we built the basic frame here in Redmond, put all of the, the fuel tanks and the engines on it, and then we shipped it off to the lab for further integration of the solar panels and the, and the uh, instrumentation pieces. So been a lot of fun to be involved in. This is one of the one of the spacecraft that I got to be involved in uh, since I've been here in Redmond. Um, so I'll switch on to a program called Lucy. I don't know if anyone's heard of it yet. That's been the code name that's been used for. I think it's starting to show up um, in uh, literature now. NASA's starting to talk about it more and more uh, as we're getting closer to launch date. Um, its goal is to go to the uh, to visit all of the Trojan uh, um, asteroids. Uh, ha we've never done that before, and so this obviously is a first. And so you can see the uh, areas that it that it's uh, planning to go to, and an uh, artist renditioning of the of the uh, spacecraft on the right. But I'll pop to the next one to give you a little bit more facts. Um, and so the Lucy mission is. Uh, we've, we just delivered the uh, engines for the um, spacecraft final assembly. We're not actually doing that spacecraft. It's be, being done by Lockheed Martin. Um, the, win the launch window opens October of 2021, and all things currently are on track to be able to hit that launch window. Um, it, it, we've delivered the engine, and it's in, in progress of being assembled. And um, once we do launch it, it's going to take four years to get to its very first target. Um, on the right, you'll see uh, artist renditioning of the three primary payloads, uh, Al Ralph, El Lori, and uh, El Tess. Um, I, you know, we can talk about those, but you can certainly look up the Lucy program and get full details on what all those payloads are designed to do. Uh, and then the targets in order of um, the visitation, and um, I think there's, if I remember right, there's... Uh, months between them or years between them, depending on the distance apart. Um, Donald Johnson's uh, not quite an asteroid. It's a, it's a small body that they're gonna meet up with at first. And then as they go through, uh, the first asteroid will be Herbades, which you can see on the right, it's about 40 miles in diameter. And it's a C-type asteroid. And then there's a, a Miniotis, which is the last one, is a P-type asteroid. And then one of the other ones in there is a D-type asteroid. So they're getting quite a bit of different opportunity as they go through, uh, as they go through the, the Trojans to, to figure out, uh, to see several different types of asteroid uh, during that process. So we're really, really excited about Lucy. Um, as I say, we've delivered the engines, but um, uh, the, it required three different types of engines. So we would put a total of 12 engines on that spacecraft uh, in addition to doing all the launch vehicle uh, engines. And so we'll provide the, um, the engines that provide the, the travel. Uh, so when we, once we leave Earth's atmosphere, 
uh, uh, leave Earth's gravitational pull to get to the, the asteroids. We'll use one set of engines for that. There's a separate set of engines which will be used for steering and control as we go through the, the transition between Earth and the target asteroids. And then another set which will be used for instrumentation control. In other words, when we're trying to use one of those imagers, it's really important that the spacecraft stay steady with uh, the object, even though they're all moving at, at uh, hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. Uh, we have to be able to keep those things together. And so that third set of engines is really designed for uh, all of the tracking for the payloads. So uh, exciting project and look forward to seeing that launch next fall. Okay. And so, because I do this presentation occasionally, um, a lot of people that aren't into space ask, why space? Why, why do we care? Why do we keep spending money on space? And, um, you know, whether, whether you're talking about that, the, the first thing that help answer the key questions about our universe, our, our, you know, we've always had this desire to know what's going on out in space. And so, it helps us answer those questions. Um, but on top of that, when it comes to what we do, what we've done for humanity, it's given us new products, right? Going to the moon gave us uh, new ways to process food. Uh, it, it, the mattresses you're sleeping on today are as a result of, uh, of, of fabrics that were developed in space before. Velcro, you know, the list goes on and on about things that we have today that are as a result of space. Had we not gone to the moon and spent all those investments, we wouldn't have the, the, the affordable solution set for the satellites that we have today. Would we have satellites today? Sure. But would they be affordable? No, you wouldn't have them for satellite TV and radio and satellite phones and uh, asset tracking and some of the other civil things we do. They'd just be too cost prohibitive. Those costs came down because of all the money that was spent to go to the moon back 51 years ago. And so as a result of that, many of the things that we're doing today are as a result of it. And so people don't think about that. They pick up their cell phone and they push, you know, take me to the mall. Um, and that's all happening because of the things that are in space. <coughs> and if we hadn't gone to the moon, they wouldn't, th those things wouldn't exist. <coughs> so when you look at what we're doing today, so who cares? Um, what are we doing for humanity? Well, let's look at Parker Solar Probe. It's learning so much about the sun that coming out of Parker Solar Probe, we'll be doing things like we'll be uh, creating new um, materials for clothing that'll help protect your skin, new sunscreens, new, new ways to protect the earth and humans and the things that we have on earth from the damaging energy that comes from the sun. Um, all those things will be learned as part of it. What about going to Mars? What are we going to learn? Well, when you think about what's the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome to go to the moon was, you know, how, how do we keep, uh, how do we keep astronauts safe? How do we feed them? How, how do we, you know, get them safely there and back again? All that's been solved. When we go to the Mars, now you got to deal with human psyche. We're going to be putting people in a small tin can. Uh, the first time for at least a year, uh, put three people together in a small tin can and say, go up there and, and, and take a ride to Mars and come back. And uh, oh, by the way, the, because of communication radio signals take so long, once you leave the moon, um, we're not going to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Everything's going to be uh, time delayed. And so when you think about the time it takes for a signal to get to Mars and back again, uh, that turnaround time is, is around seven minutes. So you're not holding a regular conversation like we are today. So the, the, we're going to have to do a lot of work on the human psyche uh, as a result. And I fully believe that what we're going to get out of going to Mars is going to be a lot of investment in mental health. Uh, it's something that you don't associate space and mental health, but I suspect that we're going to learn so much as a part, part of that that, you know, forget all the other things we're doing in space, additive manufacturing and, and uh, horticulture and so many other things that are being done today. 
those things will all pale in comparison to if we can do something to, to further our understanding of the brain and how the brain works and how we can pe help people uh, that are having issues. And so uh, the things that we're doing in space today just have such a, a benefit to, to humanity, have, have in the past and will continue to have as we go into the future. And so I, I spend about 30 minutes, I think. I've been rambling, maybe 28 minutes. So uh, let me come off of that. And Day, you're waving at me, but you're still on mute. But um, I, I can take some questions. I can go back to something. Uh, any, some of the backup charts I got, just let me know where you want to go. Oh, yeah. I don't know if anybody has any questions for him. But... Uh, I do. Um... Now, in your last the, the trip to the Trojans, you had all these motors. Are they all using the same propellants? How big yeah. is this thing? Yeah, we're using hydrazine on Lucy. Um, we did; it wasn't ready yet for the green propellant, so hydrazine will be all used on all. And they're different size engines, and so um, the the small two tenths pound engines are used for the really fine control, and then we're using. Uh, 50 pound engines for the main uh, main control engines to uh, the main um, propulsion engines. So um, dramatic, dramatically different sizes. So how many pounds of propellant do you take on a mission like this? Um, you know, I, I you don't have know any idea. Top, I don't know off the top of my head on Lucy, but based on similar spacecraft that size, we're probably taking somewhere around 600 pounds of fuel. So about a third of the weight of the spacecraft will be fuel. Gee, that doesn't seem like much, does it? it it's not, but <laughs> when you talk about two tenths uh, pound engines, I can keep a, I can keep a spacecraft um, stationary. You know, we only, we only put 400 pounds of, of fuel on, um, on, uh, on, on uh, Voyager and we are still running those engines today. <laughs> you know, and we launched in 77 with a plan of only lasting, you know, 10, 15 years. So it's just, it doesn't take a lot. Once, you, once you're away from Earth, Earth's gravitational pull, it doesn't take a lot to, uh, to move those spacecraft. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> uh, I had a question on Lucy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if they're if that mission would be taking advantage of like the periodic orbits around the libration points, because it's going to oh. L1, L4 and five. Yeah, I, I apologize. You're way over my head when it comes to mission operations. Um, okay. you, you know, the, the Lucy website's really not got much information on it yet on the mission uh, set, which is, uh, it doesn't give you much information. This image comes from um, the, their website, the one that shows the, the uh, path that they're going to use, um, but but I personally don't have any more information than that on it, so I apologize for that. And I saw a written question that asked me, uh, I understand the trip to Mars will be cut to 90 days from the backside of the moon. Yeah, that's the estimate right now. We believe that we can go from the backside of the moon once, you know, because now we don't have the Earth's gravitational pull to uh, on orbit of Mars in about 90 days. That's That's the current thought process, yes. And that's using a combination of electric propulsion and chemical propulsion together uh, to make that happen. It, it is pretty amazing, yeah. Ken? Yep. Do you hear me? Yeah. yeah I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, you know, we bought RD-80 engines from the Russians. Are you allowed to... Bad mouth them? Sell, sell engines to <laughs> other, other foreign governments is basically yeah Are so you restricted the, by it? no I, I i'm able to the the redmond operation we sell about uh 15 of my engines are exported i i'm on uh japanese spacecraft i'm on many european aircraft i i'm do roll pitch and yaw control for all of the european launch vehicles um Part of that comes from the fact that we have uh, certain size engines that others don't produce. And the second is that our, our history of 100% missing success, right? We were a little bit more expensive than some of the other manufacturers around the world, uh, but we don't fail. And so we put more money into testing and, 
and uh, emission assurance in our space in our engines than than maybe some of the foreign manufacturers do. And so, yeah, we're um, we, we export. I, I'm going to estimate around 60 engines a year, uh, and those are all small engines, right? So. Um, in the large areas, if you've been paying attention, Blue Origin won the, um, the, the competition to create the new U.S. large launch engine for the first stage. And so they're building a kerosene type engine for United Launch Alliance's big um, aircraft. To the best of my knowledge, as of today, they haven't delivered one of those yet. Um, they're still working through quite a few bugs. Um, but Aerojet has a, uh, a similar engine that replaces the Russian engine. Uh, also, um, at, it's ready for flight tests, basically. Um, and so there's two U.S. engines now that are, are available to replace anything the Russians were doing. Of course, then, you, uh, you know, Elon Musk with his own um, spacecraft has done his own engines uh, for, for launch. Now, they're much smaller launch vehicles than the big ULA vehicles, but um, he, he, the engines that uh, that Elon's uh, created are, are are quite quite good engines. So we're seeing we're seeing uh, you know the fact that he can reuse them as much as he has been is pretty good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, look, I know I, I'm not in depth on some of the things that interest you guys most relative to what's going on actually out there in space. Um, uh, but I do, as you can see, I get pretty excited about the things we're doing. Um, w with as many engines as we're producing, we're experiencing four to five launches a month. Um, it almost becomes routine. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, but the things that get us excited uh, from a company perspective are these missions like Lucy and and uh, Osiris Rex and the things that we're going to do with Mars because they're they're the ones that are game changers. Um, the things that Aerojet's doing in in Red Red forget that it's part of a big publicly traded company. It is we have to we have to make money at what we do. But if you said to the employees at Redmond, you know why do you do what you do? It, it's not. It, it's it's for nothing other than the excitement of what our what our engines are doing. There is such pride in being able to to provide these engines for all these different missions uh, that my employees have overcome a lot to be able to do that. And, um, and and while we are a publicly traded company and we do have to make a profit, it's the it's the mission that comes first. And the reason we say 100% mission success isn't because we've never had a problem. That's not the case, we, we, we do. We occasionally will get a plug a fuel line on, on orbit or um, a, a valve will fail or something like that. But we always have ways to work around it. Um, most of those systems have redundancy on them. And so um, I'll give you an example. We had a spacecraft about a year ago um, that, was, um, that was showing signs that all of the engines were failing. And what it turned out was that the was um, air in the tank, in the fuel tank. They hadn't properly bled the tanks when they filled them with fuel. And so we got air bubbles that were in that were getting stuck in the valves just above the engines. And we figured out a way to burp the engines and get all that air out of there and brought the spacecraft back. And now the spacecraft is expected to meet its full life expectancy. So it's things like that that uh, you know, that we do that say, even though there's problems on orbit, we've always managed to find a way to solve it. Uh, there's been three government spacecraft that have been launched in the last two years with a foreign made Apogee engine. Uh, the Apogee engine is the one that's, that takes it from the launch vehicle to its orbit. Um, and in three cases, that foreign made engine has failed. Uh, one case, it was the technicians at a certain company's fault because they didn't take some of the fuel caps off before they launched, but the other two were out and out failures of the engine. Um, in, in both of those cases, uh, it's sort of like that the little train that could, the little engine that could, we used our really small engines to do the same mission that that big engine would have done. It took us a whole lot longer but in all three cases, we were able to get that spacecraft to its final orbit using really tiny little engines. So the little engines that could. Now, 
we put a full two or three times life on those engines by doing it. But ultimately that's kept us from losing the spacecraft. So um, we get involved in those kind of things quite often. I probably have a on, or, on orbit investigation going on at least one all the time. Something that's going on funny with, with the spacecraft and trying to figure out why. And so we're part of those big conglomerates that, that figure that out. You have a problem with a spacecraft that belongs to the US Air Force and you've got, not only do you have the Air Force and the, the spacecraft manufacturer and the engine manufacturer like ourselves, but you have a bunch of different think tanks that work for the government that all come together the, the, you know, in universities that come together to, to try to solve the problem. And we're always integral in that, in that, uh, that piece of it. Interesting. All right. Well, Day, I, you know, I, uh, hopefully I met your expectations. We're right at 45 minutes. And so, uh, hopefully folks that, uh, we're on, enjoyed it. And, and like I said, once we get pat, well past the, the, uh, the issues of COVID, if we decide you want to do something up here in Redmond, we'll try to figure it out. Um, maybe we do the meeting offsite and bring people on, or maybe we do everything on site. We'll figure it out. But, uh, thank but, you. Uh, obviously that that's great. Great. Okay. Thanks. All right. That is great. Anybody thank else you. have any other questions for me? All right. I saw one more on, on chat there. Nope, that's the same thing. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. thank, thank you guys. I'm, I'm going to sign off then. Thank you thank very you. much, Ken. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Have a good holiday. You as well. Thank you. Hey. Good presentation, Dave.